When I wake up in the morning, I stagger out of bed, shaved, I, I take the coffee, I bring out a chair, I sit down, I thank God for, the, for another day that I woke up. And this is like my antidepressant because the medicines I take at night are so powerful to put me to sleep because basically my brain does not shut down by itself because I live with bipolar. One of the side effects of the Clozeril is sedation. It is extremely powerful. So I sleep, but in the morning, I need one 24 ounce cup of the before mentioned coffee. And it's, it's a ritual that I do. And it sort of clears my head. I grew up in the food business. My dad was a food broker, so I can't help but merchandise, even when I'm putting things into the refrigerator. And this is my lovely wife, Judy. Judy and I got engaged on December 15th of 06, and she has, puts up with my Michigas, and she really, food-wise, helps me to eat healthy. Um, She's also my best friend. We have a definite spiritual relationship with each other. He tries to relieve his stress by not doing a whole bunch of uh, uh, work-related things, but he, what he does is important. But at the same time, I wish he did more of it. I believe in working, not all the time, but a lot. I'm really not good at stress, and I know what I have to do to keep myself stable. And as much as Judy lives with me, she doesn't walk in my shoes and know exactly what it's like to live with manic depression. Being manic is like driving a car without brakes. And I was in such a high at one time that I went to Resorts International and I thought I was the Messiah. And I was handing out money and buying things and I checked into a hotel and I made a lot of phone calls. And one of the phone calls went to Media Pennsylvania, and Uncle Norm, at about 2 or 3 in the morning, drove from Media, came through the lobby of Resorts International, and took me home. That ended that episode, but, you know, I still had struggles before I achieved the sense of well-being. It's definitely a place that I go to that I feel comfortable in down here. It is a reflection on my personality. Is it cluttered? Yeah, but a lot of times my brain's cluttered too. Welcome to my cave. And you can tell I'm an Eagles fan. This was my dad, Abraham Martin Solomon. He was a strong personality. The dysfunctionality was I loved him so much that for 30, 31 years, his happiness, if he was happy, I was happy. So that was a little dysfunctional. And he was my higher power. My first wife knew that I had a mental illness, but was not really educated about it. Um, this was our wedding. It was at Oxford Circle Jewish Community Center. And I thought my life was set. We were married June 25th, 1983. I was sales manager in my dad's business. And that didn't work out. God had a different plan for me. Dad, in 1985, was given, diagnosed with cancer and given nine months to live. This was the darkest period of my life. It's like a four-bagger. I was very sick. I was going to get divorced. I was watching Dad die. I was watching Uncle Mark sell the business. And I wound up at Haverford State for 30 days. I don't remember how. The hardest work that you do is to get to a state of recovery. When you're first diagnosed, of course, there's the issue of stigma. You don't want the illness. You can't be mentally ill, I'm crazy. So when you're on medication, you don't want to take it because even if it's working, that's proof that you have the illness. And it took a lot of 
bumps in the road for me to finally accept the fact that the medication I'm on, which I'll repeat again, Clozeril and Clonopin, is something I have to do for the rest of my life. Once I got stable, you know, I thought to myself, gee, this is why I'm on the planet. And this is why God put me here. He gave me the bipolar so that I could recover and fight stigma and help to be a voice for the countless number of people with mental illness who feel like they don't have a voice. The statistic is that people with mental illness are no more violent than the general population. It's just that we get clobbered a lot of times on television. In my everyday life, when I, if I'm out in public, you'd be surprised when I share, the other person's going to open up too. Because mental illness, by and large, affects about one in every four families in America. So I don't consider myself just being an advocate as a speaker, I consider myself to be an advocate every single day of my life in every environment or situation that I might find myself in. I think it's very important to find your purpose, find some meaningful activity that you like. I grew up watching my dad become a public speaker. My favorite class in high school was public speaking. It's something I love to do. It's another vehicle for expression from someone who's trying to live a life of recovery.